I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands from which we come um, today and pay a, my respects um, to their um, elders past, present and emerging and to any members of the Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander community gathered with us today. So it's my great pleasure today to introduce this seminar because it's a really special um, seminar for the MPCCC particularly um, as we will hear from the recipient of the, um, a scholarship the MPCCC is supporting in a very special program um, in an MPCCC um, partner. So I'm really um, lucky to welcome both um, Dr. Simon Chu and um, Tran Tran, who Trang Chan, if I pronounced that correctly, sorry, it's a bit of a thank you, <laughs> um, who are going to present um, a really a game-changing research program um, that was funded in 2020 by the Medical Research Future Fund. And it's addressing challenges faced by women with um, granulosa cell tumors. Um, a, a unique set of malignant ovarian tumours. Um, the research is um, informed by and integrated with Consumer Voice, which is um, modern research and research that we all need to learn more about um, and addresses critical gaps in research and clinical care. So I am, am going to introduce Simon, who's really going to take the reins and then hand over to Trang later in the seminar. But to briefly introduce Simon, he obviously specializes in ovarian granulosa cell tumor research and is recognized internationally through the support of the granulosa cell tumor um, of the ovary foundation, um, the granulosa cell tumor research foundation of Canada and New Zealand, and through grants from the NHMRC, the Victorian Cancer Council, the Ovarian Cancer Research Foundation, the Marsha Rivkin Ovarian Cancer Research Award and the Department of Defense USA. And of course, by this recently, or fairly recently, um, awarded um, award from the Medical Research Future Fund. So Simon, I will hand over to you. Thank you very much. Um, you're up and running. I will. Thank you very much, Simon. Terrific. Thanks very much, Melissa. And thanks for the introduction. And uh, thank you to everybody that uh, we can be able to present our. Uh, our research uh, to you, especially, I know that the title is a bit of a mouthful, that's actually the title of the MRFF grant, uh, Towards a New Era in Granulose Cell Tumor Research, Patient-Driven Outcomes, Genomics, Diagnostics and Therapeutics, and essentially that's uh, exactly what uh, I will give an overview of today, but then Trang uh, will be able to be a bit more precise in, in the presentation with uh, some of the work that she's performing on the combination therapy uh, theme that we uh, offer operating under this uh, MRFF grant. So uh, as a bit of an overview of what you're going to hear this afternoon, uh, I'm going to give a bit of background on what granulose cell tumours are, um, how we really became interested in these tumours, and that's through this uh, a st a story surrounding this uh, glycoprotein known as an, a dimeric glycoprotein known as inhibin. Um, a little bit of an introduction to the mutational landscape of uh, these tumours, um, focusing on a couple of uh, uh, gene mutations uh, that uh, are prevalent for this tumour type. Um, I'll give it then an overview of really what the structure of the MRWF grant, uh, the themes that we actually uh, are in, embarking on in this uh, research program before introducing then Chang uh, to, to give an overview of her project. And then I'll have a couple of concluding slides. So we all know that ovarian cancer is not a single entity. Uh, in fact, it's a, it's a, a group of cancers that are broadly um, categorized into three main groups that uh, being the most common ones, of course, are the epithelial type tumors. Um, the most common of these tumor types are the serous, the high grade serous ovarian cancers. And in fact, we, we do know that, it, that most of those tumors probably don't originate from the ovary per se, but more from the fimbrial layer of the, the fallopian tube um, uh, surrounding the ovary. Um, a more uncommon type of ovarian cancer uh, or ovarian cancers is this group known as the sex called stromal tumors. And they account for probably about five to 8% of all ovar ovarian cancers. Um, and then there's even the rarer still uh, germ cell uh, tumors, which are about one to 3%. Now, of the sex-called stromal tumours, the 
the granulosa cell tumors uh, by far uh, or by far account for the majority of this tumor type. And so in this uh, little table here, uh, you'll see a list of uh, the different types of sex called stromal tumors. Um, and 90% of these uh, of this tumor type are those that are classified as granulosa cell tumors. Now there are two types. So one's in the, called the adult granulosa cell tumor and the other one's known as a juvenile granulosa cell tumor. Um, and of these types, 95% um, of granulosa cell tumors are of the adult, of the adult um, form. So what differentiates between the two? Well, the classification is primarily um, morphological and it has historically been so. Um, and again, as I mentioned that there are the two types, the adult GCT and the juvenile GCT, 95% versus 5%. In the histograph here, what we can see are, in fact, uh, typically uh, HNE staining of, of a, an adult form of this disease. And, uh, the, and this is a sample that's come from a primary tumor and then the subsequent recurrency um, that occurred uh, sometime uh, down the track. And typically, what, what marks the adult granulose cell tumor type of these uh, core exner bodies that that, that sort of reflect uh, a follicular type structures and um, and the cells of these tumor types are these coffee bean uh, nucleated uh, uh, type of structures and, and that uh, typically uh, signifies a, an adult granulose cell tumor. Um, juvenile GCT don't normally have these core exner bodies um, and there are other uh, subtle uh, differences between uh, an adult and a juvenile, uh, at least histologically. Um, in, in subsequently, historically, these were classified primarily morphologically, but over the last few years, uh, there has been a marker that's been discovered for the adult form, and that is a mutation that's in the FOXL2 gene. And I'll, 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 I'll uh, expand on that a little bit later. Now, these tumors, they're, they're hormonally active, um, they're endocrine related uh, cancers, and uh, they uh, really show very similar, uh, a lot of similarities with the, an FSH primed late preovulatory granulosa cell. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll uh, explain in a little bit what uh, these granulosa cells are. Um, but they typically uh, also, show a lot of um, uh, or express a lot of different hormone uh, hormones such as inhibin uh, anti-malarian hormone and estrogen so in in this uh, this immuno uh, staining um, uh, picture here from the previous slide we saw the h and e stains uh, this is a stain for inhibin in uh, both the primary and the recurrent um, recurrent tumors now our interest in these tumors actually stemmed from uh, an interest in the use of inhibin as a potential biomarker for these tumors. And, and that uh, originated many, many years ago from a study uh, from research program uh, that uh, originated in, in the old Prince Henry's Institute, um, as well as the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology, as well as um, Gynecology Oncology at Monash Health, or Southern Health back then. And this study uh, was a study by uh, Professor Tom Jobling and, and Henry Berger and um, David Healy. And, and, and what they found was in fact that the use of uh, inhibin as a biomarker for these tumors was, was, is really showed excellent, uh, it, well, was an excellent biomarker uh, in that uh, inhibin levels in a postmenopausal a uh, woman with it, this type of ovarian cancer were very, very high as compared to what one normally sees. And then uh, post after po uh, the, um, the post-surgery, um, these inhibin levels uh, dropped to uh, undetectable amounts. But, but also uh, what was really interesting was it was a very, very good marker to uh, monitor the <coughs> recurrence. And so Post, um, post initial surgery with the uh, with a recurrent tumor coming, uh, the inhibin was able to be detected in fact much before 
uh, any imaging uh, was able to detect these tumours. And so, um, uh, and so it was a, a very good marker in, in order to monitor for subsequent recurrences. Okay. And because of this, um, because of this, uh, these studies, um, it actually led to the uh, formation of what is arguably the, the world's largest GCT tumour bank, uh, whereby we've collected over many years quite a number of tumour samples from women who had this disease in, in the centre here. Um, and uh, it also had led to uh, the development of clinical assays for uh, the, this uh, particular biomarker, the total inhibitor inhibitor A and inhibitor B. So what are some of the clinical manifestations of this tumour? The peak incidence for those with granulose cell tumours is uh, 50 to 60 years. Um, I mentioned about 5% of juvenile GCT, and in fact, it, it, they don't, the, the term juvenile doesn't necessarily mean uh, in terms of age, but uh, it is a, a, a different distinct uh, subtype, but it, it does typically affect um, uh, uh, girls, um, young girls, uh, to uh, teenagers and, and but, but our oldest patient is, is current oldest patient is about 65, 69 degree, uh, years of age who has a juvenile GCT. Um, the symptoms are uh, usually a result of excess estrogen sec secretion and so uh, often presents in a clinic uh, with regular vaginal bleeding or abdominal pelvic pain um, and and then and hence are alerted a lot earlier. Um, generally, the, the, they have better prognosis than epithelial cancers, and that is because they're generally caught earlier. Um, and uh, however, about 80% of women who have advanced or recurrent disease will actually die of their disease. Um, they're very difficult to treat. Primary treatment is surgical. Uh, intra-abdominal spread makes the complete removal of these tumours uh, very difficult. And uh, they have a propensity for late recurrences. And so uh, I mentioned that they have a general, uh, a better prognosis uh, because most of these tumours are caught earlier. However, sometimes up to 30, 40 years post initial diagnosis, these tumours recur. The average is probably around the two to five year mark. Recurrent disease is treated with chemotherapy or radiotherapy, but it's often met with limited success. And that's because the regimens that are, are used to treat these uh, cancers are, are based on platinum um, containing protocols that are used for the epithelial ovarian cancers, but we know that they're very different diseases and, uh, and hence why those uh, regimens don't work. So granulosa cells are the cells that surround the oocyte in, in a, in a uh, and this is a schematic of uh, the process of follicular genesis or the nurturing of the egg to ovulation. And it's during this early stage um, of, of this, uh, this cycle uh, that granulosa cells under the influence of the of follicle stimulating hormone estrogen and other growth factors uh, rapidly proliferate and uh, release growth factors and, and nurture the oocyte uh, to the point where it can be ovulated. The granulosa cells uh, post after ovulation then differentiate uh, under the influence of luteinizing hormone um, and they differentiate into a corpus luteum and, and then become the active center of progesterone production. Um, in order to nurture fertilization and implantation. Um, through many of our studies in the past, we've actually determined that the, the cells of a granulosa cell tumor are very, very similar to those of a late, late pre um, uh, ovarian follicle. Now, we, for many years, were trying to work out what, was called, what caused one of these uh, FSH primed granulosa cells to effectively become tumorigenic. And this black box was uh, unknown for, for, for many, many years until uh, in 2009, in a, a, se a seminal paper by uh, the, the David Huntsman's group over in Canada, um, found a mutation in this gene called FOXL2. 
which um, as you'll see is um, a, a pattern mnemonic for, for this uh, tumor type. So the, the study demonstrated or showed through a whole transcriptome sequencing of just four granulosa cell tumors in their cohort that there was this heter heterozygous mutation in this, uh, this uh, gene FOXL2. They subsequently expanded that to look at archival material and found that, in fact, it was present in 97% in of their samples, 86 of the 89 uh, GCTs that they looked at uh, contain this tumor type. And no other tumors, including those of the juvenile subtype, harbored this mutation. We also conducted a similar study in our own center here, whereby we used 56 adult uh, GCT and six juvenile GCT. It was a combined study with uh, a group in Helsinki. Um, and uh, what we observed was that six of, six of the six juvenile GCT did not have that mutation, but 52 of the 56, so about 94% of the adult GCT all contain this one sp very specific mutation at C134W. There were, of the four that were negative GCT, when we looked at the pathology review of them, um, it became clear that three of them were misdiagnosed as an adult GCT. And so, uh, in fact, they, they should not have been uh, diagnosed as that in the first place. Um, it's also become a, a really useful biomarker, or sorry, a, a, as a, a very useful uh, marker to to determine or help, uh, and as seen in this study by our group as well, an immunohistochemical and molecular analysis of problematic and unclassified ovarian sex cholesterol tumors. Because remember, I mentioned there's quite a number of these tumor types. Sometimes they're difficult to to actually diagnose. And in this uh, particular study. Uh, four of the 11 tumors uh, that were uh, difficult to classify uh, showed a FOXL2 mutation, indicating that they are likely to be an adult GCT. Three of these four cases were reported initially as unclassified as sex for stromal tumors, and one as a Sartoli latex cell tumor. Um, conversely, three cases that were originally diagnosed as granulose cell tumors were actually negative. Uh, for the mutation, meaning that they were unlikely then to be a GCT. So it isn't any wonder then that why uh, FOXL2, if you, if you notice many of the gene panels, FOXL2 has actually made itself onto, uh, onto those panels um, because it is such a useful marker in, this, uh, in, in clarifying perhaps these uh, difficult cases. So in our lab, we've been, uh, we know that, uh, well, at least we know the, one of the early events uh, that occurs uh, in it's, that causes these uh, granulosa cells to become tumorigenic, and that's this mutation in the FOXL2 gene, C134W. Uh, what we don't understand, however, are what the, uh, uh, what the mechanisms are involved in these tumors becoming recurrent or aggressive um, uh, down the track. So the questions that our lab has asked over, over time is, whether we can predict recurrence through understanding some of these molecular events, uh, whether we can understand the etiology or, of aggressive and or recurrent advanced disease, and then also whether from these types of studies we can identify disease-specific therapies, uh, so as we know that the current therapy regimens do, do not work very well. So our focus has been on, on several areas, uh, nuclear receptors, NF-kappa-B and XIAP. I won't talk about those because Trang will talk uh, a little bit more about those. Um, and some of the tyrosine kinase inhibitors, again, we've uh, got published work uh, to indicate that some of these are maybe uh, useful uh, to use as well. Um, but in the whole transcriptome analysis and whole exome analysis, and then we subsequently moved to some whole genome work as well. Um, one of the, the key findings from, from this work, from our work, as well as others, um, is that there is a high uh, frequency of TERT promoter mutations and in particular, sorry, uh, and I'll, I'll so so the, the, this this may be a good prognostic marker for reasons I'll, I'll go into in a second. So in this graph that's uh, from uh, this, uh, this this study here, looking at the mutational landscape of metastatic cancer, um, this is a, a prevalence of the TERT promoter mutation across a whole series of different. 
uh, the tumor types. And, and you'll notice uh, some tumor types have very high prevalence of, the of, uh, of, of mutations in the TERP promoter. Um, and in granulosa cell tumors, what we discovered was that in fact 42% of all the granulosa cell tumors that we looked at harbored a mutation in the TERP promoter mutation. Now, when we broke this down into stage one and stage three, what we observed, and it's one specific mutation in one, only one of the hotspots, was that 30% of those with stage one harbored the mutation, while 70% of those who had aggressive or stage three recurrent tumors had this uh, uh, promoter mutation. What is uh, also uh, fascinating is in fact, remember this is a, uh, an ovarian cancer, but when you look at uh, all ovarian cancer, uh, it, in fact, there's a very low frequency of this promoter mutation. And so it's something very specific to those of, of this tumor type. So uh, we've got a real interest then in decoding the genomic landscape of GCT. And so there's a few other groups too, uh, particularly those in Canada and, and, and a couple of other groups. And, and so a critical challenge for, for GCT management is really to identify markets that predict late recurrence and or aggressive behavior. Um, in order to develop more effective targeted therapeutic strategies. Um, so we know that FOXL2, the FOXL2 mutation is pathognomonic for the adult GCT, and that there's this high frequency of the TERT promoter mutation, especially in those with advanced adult GCT. Um, there are also reports of low frequency mutations in, in both this KMTD2 and uh, the gene, as well as the tumor suppressor TP53. Um, but effectively, in all these studies that have been performed, specific putative second hit mutations have remained to be identified. Um, and uh, particularly those that drive advanced disease, they, they need to be identified. And uh, as well, uh, studies involving understanding gene fusions and link RNAs uh, haven't been um, performed as yet. When it comes to the juvenile uh, form of this disease, in fact, the molecular basis for this even rarer type is even more poorly understood. And uh, we know that there are some mutations in this in the G-alpha-S, one of the G-protein, uh, GSP oncogene, where we're about 30% that might harbor mutations in this gene. Um, there are also in, uh, mutations in the AKT, um, in AKT, where 60% of juvenile GCTs have an in-frame duplication that involves the flexion uh, homology domains uh, that lead to the activation of AKT1. But there has been no systematic review of the mutational landscape for ju the juvenile form of the disease. So our, what our work then has done is it's led to our involvement with a, a number of patient and consumer advocate groups um, that uh, have helped inform not only our research, but also helping to drive uh, some of the directions that we're going. Um, and so one of these groups is this GCT Survivor Sisters. It's a worldwide moderated members only Facebook group. Um, it's a group I can't join uh, or any of my team members can't join, uh, mainly because, because we're not survivors. Um, however, in order to join this, uh, this group, this, uh, this, this consumer group have a database uh, containing a whole series of different questions regarding diagnosis, advice, management, types of um, treatments that they've undergone, quality of clinical encounters and so forth. And, and now there's probably about 1500 uh, patients and survivors who are documenting their experiences as part of this Facebook group. Uh, we also have a, uh, a, a partnership with this uh, charity in New South Wales called Rock Inc or Rare Ovarian Cancer Incorporated, particularly focusing on raising awareness and funds for the juvenile granulose cell tumor research. And uh, one of the, the uh, one of the, the, so the CEO of this particular organization is one of the CIs on our MRWF grant. Um, and we also uh, have a, a really nice association with the Granulose Cell Tumor Research Foundation, which is a patient advocate group in New Zealand and Canada. So what the, the, having this partnership has done is it's led us to be able to uh, partake in this MRFF um, uh, um, 
EPCDER, um, which is um, the, the consumer driven research arm of an NIFF um, grant, which focused on ovarian cancer. And, and we're using the uh, partnerships with this particular or these particular groups who have an interest in both the adult and GCT, uh, juvenile GCT, to basically try to fill in the gaps in the research, which are broadly sort of highlighted in these boxes here. But what we've done is we've actually uh, looked at all of these aspects in five different themes. And so the first theme is to uh, expand on uh, the patient experience and, and you, it's particularly using that database met, I mentioned in the GCT Survivor Sisters, the Facebook group, whereby we can try to use real world data in order to, to identify gaps in the patient experience information, clinical care, health services and support. Um, the other two other themes are, are based around the biology and the etiology and, and so beyond Fox cell 2 we're interested in understanding what the genomic landscape for these tumor types are, both identifying genomic mutations that lead to the development of both adult as well as the juvenile forms of the disease. Um, and then also understanding the molecular pathogenesis A, of Fox cell 2 mutation, what is it actually doing? We, we still don't quite fully understand how it leads or contributes to the formation of these tumors. Um, the TERT promoted mutation, how that's contributing, and any other mutations that we identify in this second arm, um, this second theme, will also lead into this um, third theme. Um, we're also interested in establishing a cost effective, highly specific, uh, and sensitive mass spec method of detecting uh, inhibin, uh, because currently there is uh, the, the, the uh, ELISA inhibin test is now not being used um, or is uh, an inferior version of this assay is only being used in one centre in Australia. Um, and then lastly, uh, the area of therapeutics and particularly looking at combination therapy, uh, a precision medicine approach for GCT, where we want to test novel combination drug therapies um, uh, that will specifically target the pathogenic uh, pathways that are involved in this disease. And, and then the outcomes of that is to lead to a better understanding of the causes and underlying factors that contribute to the development of, of this disease, um, which will lead, ultimately lead to improved diagnosis and treatment of GCT. And then we hope then that will feed back to our consumer groups um, in this uh, collaboration. So with that, I'd like to introduce, uh, just to, to, to expand on that fifth theme, uh, Trang Tran, who is the MPCCC PhD scholar, um, who's a, a wonderful recipient of, of this uh, award, and, and thank you to MPCCC for this. Trang uh, is a, 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 a student uh, from uh, originally from Vietnam, who did a Bachelor of Biotech from, uh, in Vietnam, um, and also worked as a research and development officer there before coming and doing a Master of Biotech at Melbourne University for focusing on commercialization in, in biotechnology. But she did have a real interest in, in research and, uh, and hence joined my lab a couple of years ago as a research assistant uh, before and subsequently now um, uh, embarking on a PhD program uh, under uh, uh, this MRWF grant and MPCCC uh, scholarship. So uh, I'll hand over to Trang. If you would like to now, I'll stop sharing and you can share your screen and we'll enjoy listening to what Thank you are you, doing. Thank you, Simon. Um, I wish it's so, um, You can see that, right? Thank you. Um, so before starting my talk, I would like to uh, thank MPCCC for supporting to my project. So uh, my project is a, a recession medicine approach to treat ovarian granulosa cell tumor. And um, I will start with an overview of PPAI gamma, XIP, and smart memetic. Uh, then the drug screening, and uh, the last one will be model developing for the drug testing. So our lab were curious about um, 
how nuclear receptor expressed in GCT and GCT deprived cell light. And to provide the gene expression, we use 40A human nuclear receptor and normalize with 16 internal control. Then um, doing the real pump PCR in 14 GCT sample and the GCT deprived cell light, the KGN. So um, the KGN have enrolled the uh, Fox L. To C134 W mutation. Um, and what we found is that um, the uh, PPAI gamma and its partner, the uh, red tenoid X receptor alpha, has high expression in the GCT um, and the KGN. So the blue bar represents 14 GCT sample and um, the red triangle um, represents the KGN cell. And um, this figure show the um, expression of PPA uh, AR gamma in the protein level um, using the immunohistochemistry. Um, so like, uh, as you can see in here, the um, PPA AR gamma high expression in the uh, primary and uh, recurrent GCT compared to a little bit expression in the postmenopausal ovary. And um, so the, um, what is the PPAR gamma? It's the hyproxom proliferator activated receptor gamma. And uh, it's play critical role in lipid and glucose metabolism. And um, PPAR gamma is uh, anti-proliferative and promote differentiation of the GC. And um, it's agonist. Um, T60 was developed as anti-diabetic drugs, um, such as the uh, triclitazone or like the uh, procyclitazone, uh, etc. And um, the T60 has minimal effect on PPAR gamma activity um, and the cell proliferation due to the transgression uh, by the NF-kappa B pathway. And uh, thanks, Dr. Uh, Didi Run, to uh, doing uh, this work. Now, uh, when we transfected the um, PPAR gamma reporter um, construct, uh, that's called the PPRE4 group, uh, we found that they like, compared to the vehicle in here, they like, um, there's a little bit uh, signal of the PPAR gamma when we uh, treat with the PPAR gamma and the RXR agonist. And then uh, when we combine with the uh, nf kappa B inhibition um, inhibitor, it causes a high expression of the PPAR gamma. And that's uh, show the nf kappa B trend refresh in the PPAR gamma signaling. And also like um, in here, when we um, Similar with the reverse one, like uh, in the cell proliferation, when we try to combine the um, NF kappa B, um, the 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 NF kappa B uh, inhibitor, like compared to the um, PPAR gamma um, and agon agonist and the RFR agonist only, so um, it show the high and um, significant degrees of the proliferation. And it's just a small um, proliferation. However, when we combine with the uh, PPAR gamma um, antagonist, um, it blocks the debris uh, proliferation. Um, so in summary, the PPAR gamma um, and the RXR agonist uh, cause a small debris in proliferation. And when combined with the NF kappa B inhibitor, it caused the induced of um, apoptosis and um, the debris in the proliferation of the cell um, GCT debris cell line. But we cannot target the NF kappa B because uh, it's critical, um, like critical problem in the normal physiology of uh, uh, physiology. So then we uh, need to look further the like, downstream protein uh, for example the IFT family and uh, because it's modulated and FKB in the fit forward loops 
before I mention about the, uh, I talk about the SIP, I would like to um, give an overview of the apo uh, apoptosis uh, pathway. So there's two pathways, the extrinsic and intrinsic. Uh, in the extrinsic pathway, the death receptor ligand will bind to the death receptor and um, activate the fast associated death domain, then they uh, release the caspase 8 and activate the caspase 3 to lead to the apoptosis. Um, in here, in the intrinsic pathway, the if the cell stress or get DNA damaged by the UV or radiation, the mitochondria will uh, release the cytochrome C and the SMAP. So the cytochrome C will uh, create the apoptosome that uh, inhibit the cas uh, that's why to the caspase nine and um, activate the uh, caspase three and lead to the uh, apoptosis and um, Without the cell stress, uh, usually the um, XIP uh, will bind to the caspa 9 and caspa 3 We are the bird 2 and bird 3 domain and they like, inhibit the uh, activation of this caspa so that the cell will arrive. But like, um, in the cell stress in condition, like the mitochondria will, uh, will release the SMAP. And then they, uh, the SMAP will bind to the bird 2 and bird 3 domain of the XIP and block the function of XIP. Then um, the, this caspa will be activated um, and lead to apoptosis. So the XIAP is a member of the IAP family that uh, potently inhibit caspa activity is potent inhibitor of caspase 3, 7, and 9. And uh, XIP is also expressed in the GCT and GCT derived cell line. And uh, given its role in apoptosis, um, that's why we um, target the XIP as the therapeutic target for um, some of the tumor type and especially the GCT. So um, in here, you can see that like, the XIP and PPA are gamma highly expressed in the GCT um, tumor. And um, there's a little bit expression of the IAP1, but like, no expression of the IAP2 compared to the control. So that's why we focus on the XIP and the PPA are gamma. SMAC is the second mitochondrial uh, activator of the caspa, and it's an um, endogenous in, uh, inhibitor of the XIP. So it's to bind to the uh, domain 2 and 3 and uh, inhibit the XIP function, as I mentioned before. Then um, we'll prevent the um, inhibition of the caspa 3, 7, and 9. And uh, the SMAC mimetic is mimic. Um, the SMAC function and then bind to the XIAP and IAP or other IAP family to um, inhibit the effect of um, the family to the caspa activity. And these are two of the um, SMAC mimetic compounds. So the compound A uh, was developed uh, to target the XIAP and uh, it's widely used in vitro. Uh, However, it's quite toxic to the um, the mice. Then um, that's why uh, uh, the the compounds were uh, modified to um, develop the verina pen, which um, used uh, in the in vivo work because it's less um, toxic to the mice. And um, so when we uh, combine the um, XIAP inhibitor and the PPA uh, gamma activator, um, we found that like, um, the number of cell proliferation significant decreased compared to the control. Um, similar with the apoptosis, so the number of uh, cell death uh, is significant high compared to the control. And uh, we found the same effect with the ferret model. So in here, this is the uh, ferret cluster, and uh, in the DMSO, that's the control. And when we uh, click with the 
combination therapy uh, is kind of like destroy the cluster with the cell death. So this is how um, we figure out the uh, interesting target and try to do the uh, combination therapy to treat the um, GCP uh, debris cell line. But uh, we also interested on uh, try to repurpose uh, available drugs. That's why we are um, doing the high throughput drug screening and um, thanks to the Hassan Monarch uh, Pediatric Re uh, Recession Medicine Program to help us with the drug screening. And we use the FDA approved kinase inhibitor and Cambridge cancer compound uh, for the drug screening. So we start with two cell lines, um, the KGN, that's the GCT deprived um, cell line, uh, and also the HRC1, that's um, is the normal cell line for the control. And uh, we strip with or uh, without the smart magnetic. Um, then uh, after 24 hours, we strip with this compound and um, interval for um, 72 hours, then uh, sending up for the drug screening. And uh, thanks, uh, Mr. Ashley, for um, prepare the uh, experiment. Yeah. And this is the um, outcome of the drug screening. Um, so uh, these are the percentage of uh, cell viability uh, be compared between the control and the treatment in the HGN. Um, and every single dog in here represents one um, compound. And uh, as you can see in here, the majority of the compounds does not uh, affect the cell viability. But um, these are some of the compounds under the uh, red line in here. So this means they are um, less of 20% of cell viability and they are like over 80% of cell death uh, when treatment with these compounds combined with the smart magnetic. And we narrow down the number of the uh, compound by like 10% of cell viability. And um, in here for the red bar, uh, it's like when we treat um, the cell with the, uh, without the smart just for the um, this compound in here. And when we uh, combine with the uh, smart magnetic, it's represented uh, in the black uh, bar in here. So you can see uh, it's the um, clear synergistic effect um, when we treat the smart magnetic combined with this compound. And uh, for, for other um, investigation, we found that uh, this compound uh, falls into quite a, a common target. So um, the histone, uh, the acetylase, uh, turbo isomerase, proteosome and uh, DNA and RNA synthesis. So um, we start uh, to do formal, uh, further investigate with uh, the panel binosas um, because they, uh, for the, the, we would like to target the HDAC. So the HDAC is the enzyme regulate um, the gene expression. And um, so the inhibitor of the HDAC, the, uh, for example, the panel venostas will cause the hyperacetylation, uh, which can be adapted uh, by the normal cell, uh, normal cell, but uh, will cause the death of the cancer cell. And uh, also the, the reason we choose um, the panel venostas um, is the star for further investigation. Because first, it shows clear uh, synergistic effect with the smart magnetic. And the second is that like, it's FDA approved drug for the uh, multiple myocloma. So it's higher chance for us to transfer to the clinical trial. And then for my PhD project, I will uh, develop the models for the drug testing. Um, the three models are the KGN cell um, synodraft, um, the patient derived organoids, and the patient derived Sinorap. And I will test uh, two combination therapy, uh, that's uh, PPAR and uh, RSR agonist combined with the smart mimetic. And also the panel Vinostat combined with smart mimetic. And for the um, 
KGN um, sonograph model, of course, I will inject KGN cell into the mice, either intra peri um, toneal or like orthotopic. And then, like, drip with a uh, farina pan and selected compound, either oral or injection, and then uh, monitor and record the tumor site and metastasis. And when we uh, got the tumor from the patient, uh, we will try to um, I will try to um, develop the organized and sonograph model. So um, the reason we need to um, develop this model because they uh, most of our uh, um, study before are in vitro with um, KGN cell light only. So we are interested on how um, the combination therapy uh, will affect the cancer cell in the organized and the mouse model. And also um, when the tumor uh, uh, like removed from the patient, the cancer cell will um, spontane uh, spontaneously luteinize and differentiate in bribery culture. And it's quite difficult to maintain the same feature. That's why um, we try to um, validate and create the uh, uh, organized in the serum free system um, to uh, maintain the uh, same feature for further investigation. And um, this is um, the um, organized cluster from day one to day uh, 28. So um, at this day, we can like, start to split, uh, freeze or like, pass it then for um, the further in, uh, study. And um, for the uh, PTX models, so we, um, again, when we get the tumor from the patient, I uh, will um, put uh, the tumor fragment uh, into the mice, either injection or surgery, then check with a uh, barina pan and selective compound, either oral or injection, and then monitor and recall tumor site and metatapsin. And I would like to say thank you, uh, Dr. Ho and Dr. Oi, um, for uh, starting uh, this work and also show me how to do the work. And for further investigation, one of uh, our, the PhD students in our group um, working on the horn genome sequencing and RNA sequencing data, and if she found some gene fusion or actionable mutation, um, I will. Um, use this as a target um, and test in three models that I develop. And also um, another part of my PhD project, um, interesting on the constitutive activation of NF paper B and AP1 pathway. So I would like to know, um, to understand the mechanism underlying that. And uh, the significance of my PhD project are the recurrent and OSU GCD uh, cause substantial mortality and morbidity and full response to the cytotoxic therapy on surgical resection underlie an urgent unmet need for the effective therapy. Um, so the outcome of this study will potentially um, identify new therapeutic target and identify the underlying basis for GCP cytogenesis. And um, I would like to um, acknowledge and thank you for the all people in this slide, especially uh, MPCCC uh, for supporting my project. Yeah. And thank So I stop sharing. Yeah. Right. Thank you, Chang. And so I, I'll just uh, finish up with a, a, just this final concluding slide here. Where uh, that encapsulating all of this, uh, our research into rare a rare cancer. Uh, in fact, research in rare cancers are often prismatic, um, and that is that they may help clarify mechanisms in this case of normal ovarian function, but potentially also provide insights into other dysfunctions of the ovary, and particularly those that uh, are. are involve the granulosa cells. So perhaps other sex caused stromal tumors or uh, premature ovarian failure or polycystic ovarian syndrome or other aspects of infertility. So some of this research hopefully might lend itself to understanding some of these uh, 
provide some insights as well. Um, and, and, and finally, given the importance of this, these diseases, um, the insight from this research will hopefully have a significant impact on women's health. Um, uh, I'd like to just reiterate too that the MRFF grant was not only a terrific surprise and, and wonderful uh, for us uh, here uh, in our research group, but it couldn't have been possible without important partnerships and particularly the partnership uh, with uh, MPCCC, uh, the Ovarian Cancer Research Foundation and the Victorian Cancer Agency have all provided uh, wonderful support through uh, a scholarship for PhD students. Um, and so all that we can say really there is thank you very much for, for that. It, it, it's uh, not only uh, helps our research, but it also was such an important part of us being able to uh, get this uh, particular grant. And then lastly, I'll just finish up with uh, the acknowledgement slide there of everybody on this slide. But uh, I think particularly I'd like to acknowledge the ones in the lab, um, Maria and Trang, uh, and Abby, um, as well as uh, current students in, term, in, in, in Trang, as well as Tian and Qianzi, um, uh, who have all been uh, wonderful contributors to the program, and everybody else who's on this slide who I won't have time to go through, but uh, are all important uh, partners. So with that, thank you, and uh, I'll be happy, and we'll both be happy to take questions, I'm sure. Yeah, thanks very much, Simon and Trang. We do have a few minutes for questions, if anyone would like to just turn the microphone on and and ask the question, I think. Um, Vicky, hello. Oh, I'm, hi, Hagan. Oh. <laughs> um, I was just interested, by the way, great talk, um, Simon and Trang. Fantastic, really interesting work. Um, I just, I'm just curious about, as soon as you mentioned next-gen sequencing, my, you know, everything opens for me. Um, I was just interested in what uh, technology, what sequencing technology you were using um, and planning to use for your whole genome sequencing and uh, RNA sequencing. And also, um, excuse my naivety uh, about ovarian cancer and, and, and in particular this, this type, but um, is, do you see any role of circulating tumor DNA um, being used you know, in the future for perhaps early detection or or surveillance or anything. Yeah, thanks, Vicky. Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll so so the, the platforms that we're using, we, we're actually using BGI. Oh, yeah. Uh, for both the whole uh, genome and, and the RNA seq. Uh, uh, the RNA seq has actually been performed here at um, Medical Genomics. Um, oh, yeah. So that uh, is Illumina, of course. Um, oh, yeah. But, but our whole genome sequencing is done by uh, BGI for yep. um, cost reasons. Okay. <laughs> um, the, uh, in answer to your second question about circulating tumor uh, DNA, um, there has been actually a, a study uh, done to show the effectiveness of um, detecting FOXL2 in the TERT promoter mutation. Yeah. And uh, it wasn't too bad, um, mm. but it wasn't brilliant, I guess, as, 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 as mm. many of these techniques go. Um, yeah. it, it's a, um, it's potentially useful for recurrence, uh, but yeah. certainly not early detection because um, most women who present actually don't present with in, with a view of having a granular cell tumor. Right. Um, but yeah. Okay. Um, but in terms of uh, the, the, well, detecting the FOXL2 mutation is actually better than detecting the TERT promoter mutation in, in a circulating tumor. Okay, great, thank you. So may I ask a question? Uh, great talk. Uh, so two questions actually. So one is about the mass spec technology that you are using for inhibiting. Is it like a targeted approach or you just use discovery approach? And then the second question is, uh, I mean, how, for example, when you're talking about like a rare cancer, how many, maybe I missed this, uh, how many cases we have, for example, per year in Australia? And do you think there would be some potential to have like preventive vaccines for these patients? So do you think that is something that we can think about? So 
we probably, if, if by the stats, are looking at maybe somewhere between 80 and 100 patients a year mm. in Australia. Um, it's, we, we have about 1,500 new cases of ovarian cancer and we're looking maybe at only about 5%, 5 to 8% uh, of the GCT. Um, so, so from that point of view, it, it's still significant, but it's, it's, it's a rare cancer. Um, and so your first question was? So it was about the mass spec technique that you oh, want to perfect. use. You. Yeah, so this, it is, we are trying targeted. Uh, it, it's actually proving a, a little bit difficult. Um, it's not, in heaven's not always an easy protein to work with yeah. uh, in that sense, but uh, one of our PhD students is, uh, is uh, collaborating with their Bio21 at the moment. So you need to have absolute quantification then because it's something that you need to have. Like if it's higher than a range, then it's like a biomarker. It's like this. Yeah. One of the benefits mm -hmm. of, of that study, in fact, was that over the years at Monash Health, there was a co large collection of serum samples uh, from uh, query patient, um, uh, patients who'd gone, who'd gone through uh, Monash Health uh, Gynae oncology department. Um, we have a, quite a number of samples that are very high in HIBNs as tested by ELISA, mid, mid range, low, uh, uh, low range, and then undetectable range as well. So we're using those samples to try to uh, develop this uh, technique. Um, but it's it's still a low abundant protein and the difficulty with serum samples of course is uh, trying to uh, remove all the high abundant protein because it becomes just noise so yeah. it's it's not as easy as we had hoped yeah yeah right i mean we can have a chat about this maybe offline yeah no it would be really interesting yeah to do so. it's probably stimulated a lot of thinking around a lot of the interesting molecules that you've shown us. XIOP is amazing. Um, but anyway, for another time, we shall probably should um, wrap up given that we've just gone after three. But thank you, Simon Trang, so much for coming and presenting that. That was really fascinating. And actually, I think a really good format. I think the MPCCC should think more about having these sorts of formats. It was nice to see work across the scope of a team. Um, and Tran, we look forward to hearing more. We hope you'll come back and tell us more as your PhD progresses so that we can um, keep in touch with you and find the next opportunity to springboard um, to support other work um, as we've, we've done in this instance, but we need to find many more instances to do this. Um, so thank you very much both for, for coming and doing it today. Thank Our next seminar is thank absolute you. pleasure. <laughs> Our next seminar is actually on August 12th and um, Alex um, Swybrook from the Garvin is coming to speak. There'll be further circulars to give you some heads up about that. Um, otherwise, we can keep you informed about our other activity, which is increasing in momentum, given that we are now joined by new members of the MPC team. Um, I can take this opportunity. I know, Hannah, you haven't got a microphone to say hello, but we can wave at Hannah, our new comms officer, just to introduce you. And um, Lama Karum, who's at least at my top end on the right, who's the MPCCC program oh, manager, <laughs> who can speak to us, who you will see, be seeing more of and hearing from more often in the future. Um, but otherwise, I think I can wish you a very nice weekend. Um, thank you very much for coming. Nice to see you and enjoy the rest of the afternoon. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.